This is a wonderful pleasure uh, to be talking to you all. Uh, I was just telling my wife, my wife, lo she loves, uh, she loves uh, South America. And I was telling her that, you know, I have given talks in every other continent except Antarctica and South America. So today, nice to be giving a talk, uh, at least over Zoom in South America, so I can tick that box. Yeah, thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be talking to you all. So uh, the title of my talk is Ophthalmic Drug Delivery by Contact Lenses. And as I said, I'm a professor and department head currently in chemical and biological engineering at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, so, uh, you know, you are all ophthalmologists. So obviously you're familiar that uh, uh, you can deliver drugs by eye drops. Of course, that's the most common way of delivering drugs. But the problem is when you put the drug in your eye, most of the drug doesn't end up going to the cornea. Because what happens is when you blink, a lot of the drug, uh, can, you, can you see my, uh, my mouse? Can you see the arrow on the mouse? Move it, uh, yes, but not very good. You can change it to the laser pointer down left. Yes, I think, no, it's not the option. Uh, yes, the, the next uh, icon, yes. Laser pointer, yes, better, okay, much, much right. better. Thank you. Sure, of course, yeah, thank you. So uh, yeah, the drug, what you want is the drug to go from here into the cornea. What happens is a lot of drug also goes to the conjunctiva because as you all know, the area of conjunctiva is much larger than the area of cornea. So a lot more drug goes through the conjunctiva than the cornea. And also what happens every time you blink, you have the steers being pushed into the puncta and then to the nose. So the net result is only about 1% of the drug that you put in actually goes to the cornea. So let's say the target tissue is somewhere here for glaucoma, only about 1% drug goes here and the rest of it all basically goes to other parts of the body. And that can actually cause toxicity because once it goes into the conjunctiva, it basically mixes with the blood that is flowing through the blood vessels in the conjunctiva and then goes into systemic circulations. So really those are, those are some of the major problems with eye drops. So what happens is uh, here's some data that we have in our, obtained in our lab for a concentration of drug in tears. So this is a drug called perfenidone, which I understand is something that you're interested in. So if you put an eye drop of perfenidone in the, in the eye, what happens is the concentration is very high. It's about uh, four milligram per ml because that's the concentration in the eye drop, but then very quickly it basically drops to zero. In about two minutes, all the drug is gone. And in these two minutes, if you look at how much went into the aqueous humor, which is where you really want the drug to go, uh, only a very small amount percent goes, only 1% goes, uh, well, actually, so yeah, you can calculate from this concentration profile that only 1% of the drug actually made it to the aqueous humor, which obviously is a very small percentage. Now, if you use contact lenses, there are some very obvious benefits of contact lenses, because if you put a contact lens on the eye, and if you have drug in the contact lens, you can intuitively imagine that whatever drug comes out of the contact lens from the backside, most of it will end up going into the eye. There is still some drug that will go from the front surface into conjunctiva, but a very large portion will end up directly into the cornea. So to prove that, here again is the data for the same drug. It's again, perfilidone. But here now the data is for, uh, uh, for the contact lens. So if you look at on the y-axis is the concentration in tear film. And uh, you can see that the concentration is much higher than the concentration that you saw in the previous slide for the eye drop. And actually that data is here as well. So this, is, this data is for contact lens, this data is for eye drop. You can see in the contact lens, the concentration is much lower, which is good because then you will not get toxicity but the drug lasts much longer compared to eye drop in which case the concentration spikes and then basically completely goes away. And you can see the same thing in aqueous humor. So again, in aqueous humor, if you compare contact lens with the eye drop, you see the concentration can get up as high as 160 microgram per ml compared to only 10 microgram per ml with an eye drop. So you can see you have a significantly higher concentration. And then if you calculate what is called bioavailability, which is what fraction of the drug ends up in the eye, it is 50% with contact lens and only 1% with eye drops. So this tells Dr. you that- Dr. Chauhan, yeah. excuse yes. me. Yeah? A question. Those uh, values in the upper uh, figures are with a standard soft contact lenses? Uh, yes, I will tell, I will show, yes, they are standard contact lenses, but I will show you what we do uh, to increase what is called residence time. So they are, they are basically with contact lenses in our lab, but 
but you will get more or less the same results with commercial contact lenses. But you will see a little bit later in the talk, uh, what's the difference? So yeah, in some sense, you, I haven't introduced the contact, but I'll show you in the next slide of what we do uh, to the contact lenses to get these results. So the point is that, yeah, the contact lens is much very good at delivering drug. A lot of the drug goes into the eye compared to eye drops. But the challenge is, so here again, I'm comparing contact lens with eye drop in the same figure, so you can see clear differences. So you can see the top figure is with contact lens, the lower figure is with eye drop. You can see you can get much higher concentration, last much longer, and this actually is happening even though the amount of drug in the contact lens was actually 60, 60 microgram, and the amount in the eye drop was more. Because sometimes people see this figure and they say, oh, you must have put more drug in the contact lens. That's not the case. We are getting this result, even though the mass of drug in the contact lens was actually less than the eye drop. So the reason why we are getting much more is simply because of higher bioavailability, not because the amount of drug in the lens is high. So, uh, so the question then is, you know, and uh, so when I show this data, the question I immediately get asked is, okay, then why is there no commercial product in the market? So people actually have been trying from as early as 1970s. If you do a search on contact lens drug delivery, you will see papers from 70s of people trying. The reason it never worked was, uh, as Dr. Tello asked, what were, which lenses were, you, were, were we using? If you just take a commercial contact lens, and then what happens is if you load the drug in it, the drug comes out very quickly. So here, there's a drug, it's a timolol drug, it's not pyrifinidone, but the data for pyrifinidone is similar. If you take timolol, and if you take many different contact lenses, some of these are hydrogen lenses, some of these are silicon hydrogen lenses, these are all soft lenses. We don't work with hard lenses because the entire market these is soft lenses. So all these soft lenses, the drug comes out very quickly. And that's not good because then the benefit of contact lenses is almost lost. Because then what will happen is the drug will come out too quickly, there'll be too much concentration and there might be toxicity. And also you may have to put multiple contact lenses in a day and that obviously is not viable. So that has been the big challenge in the contact lens drug delivery field of how do you make the lens release the drug slowly. So we have many patterns in this, uh, we have developed many different technologies, but the technology that I want to cover today is the one we are most excited about because it really works very well with a lot of different drugs. And also the technology is very, very simple. So we call this uh, diffusion barrier technology. So to illustrate that, imagine that you have a contact lens here, uh, and then you put some drug molecules. The molecules are shown to be very big circles, just for the ease of uh, illustration. And then if you put these drugs, and then if you put this contact lens in the eye, the drug will basically go very quickly into the eye. But now what we do is we create barriers. So if you create these barriers, the drug then has to and this is a picture of the barrier. So imagine now you have, we take a contact lens and we create these barriers and I'll show you how. Then the drug has to diffuse around these barriers and that leads to release duration that is much longer. So the idea is the same for hydrophobic drug. The previous idea I showed you for hydrophilic drug. Now hydrophobic, these barriers we are making out of vitamin E. So these are great barriers for hydrophilic drugs because hydrophilic drugs cannot dissolve in vitamin E. So they have to diffuse around the barrier. The, Interestingly, vitamin E also works as a barrier for hydrophobic drugs, even though in that case, the drug can solubilize. So in that case, what happens is the drug can actually diffuse into the barrier and then diffuse across it because it is soluble in vitamin E. But still, because vitamin E is very, very viscous, the drug can dissolve, but it can go very, very slowly through the, through the vitamin E, and so you still get the barrier effect. So it really works very well for both hydrophilic and hydrophobic drugs, and I'll show you the data to prove that. Now, uh, where we, so the question now is, where are these barriers located? So if you look at us, what a silicon hydrogel contact lens looks like, a silicon hydrogel contact lens, which is really the biggest lens uh, in terms of the market currently, and it, it's the only lens that is approved for extended wear, these lenses have two different types of materials, a silicon material and a hydrophilic material. And we believe, so this, and both of these materials form what are called nano channels inside a contact lens. So if you look at a contact lens with a very, very high magnification, you will see channels of silicone and channels of the hydrophilic material. And we believe our vitamin E is forming barriers at the interface between these two. So this is where our vitamin E is forming barriers. 
And the way we make these barriers into the contact lens is actually very, very simple, which is what makes this method very elegant. All we do is we take a, and actually you can do it in your lab. It's so simple. Uh, you take a silicone contact lens and you dip it in a solution of vitamin E dissolved in ethanol because vitamin E doesn't dissolve in water. So you have to dissolve it in ethanol. And then you take the, so what happens is ethanol goes in, takes vitamin E with it, and then you take the lens out and put it in buffer. So the ethanol just comes out into the buffer, but vitamin E remains inside because it is not soluble. And that's how you create barriers to the contact lens. So very, very simple approach. So the question is, does it really work? So here's data of a drug called uh, bimetoprost. So bimetoprost is a drug used for glaucoma. It's a very, uh, it's a very big market share for the drug. It's a prostaglandin analog. So here's a picture of a contact lens. This is the contact lens without vitamin E barriers. And here's a picture with vitamin E barriers. And you can see the lens remains completely transparent. You can see through the lens, even though it has vitamin E. But if you look at the drug release, without vitamin E, the drug comes out very, very quickly. If you start adding vitamin E, the drug takes longer and longer time to come out. So you significantly increase the release duration. And this is the data. So on the y-axis, I'm plotting what percentage of biometaprose diffuses out on the x-axis time. And I'm doing it for a lens called Active Oasis, which is a very commonly used uh, commercial contact lens. So we take a commercial contact lens. This doesn't have any vitamin E. Then we load vitamin E. And you can see, depending upon how much we load, we can slow down the release to whatever amount we want. And so for example, here, the drug is now coming out for about 400 hours. So 400 hours, you can see is about 15 days. But that's more than enough. You don't, because uh, you don't, you can't wear these lenses for more than 15 days. You have to replace the lens. So 15 days is the absolute maximum. In some cases, some patients like to take the lens out every day. Some patients like to keep the lens on for one week. Some people like to keep lenses for two weeks. So it really depends. Eventually, if we have to design a contact lens, which a patient is going to accept. And the, how long a patient wears a lens really depends on the patient, that patient, how comfortable he or she is in contact lens, what the doctor recommends. So as engineers, we want to design solutions that can be applicable for a large different group of patients. So that's why we want to have control over release duration. And here you can see we can achieve that with vitamin E. We can release it for one day, two day, three day, up to 15 days, depending on whatever, how, how much amount of vitamin E we put in. So that's great. Uh, as I said, we can increase it to about uh, 600 hours, which is a big increase. Uh, so this shows that, this again shows the same data. It shows that the amount of time we release it for, this is the, uh, this is the fold increase. So previously I was showing the, in terms of real hours. This tells you uh, that, let's say we percent, put 10% vitamin E. If you put 10% vitamin E, the release duration will increase tenfold. If you put 20% vitamin E, release duration will increase 20 fold. With 30%, it will increase 40 fold. So we can very nicely control release duration simply by controlling how much vitamin E we put into the lens. So this is, uh, then the question is, does, is the vitamin E bad for the lens? It's clearly good for drug release, but does it do something that is bad for the lens? So we measured every important property. And here I'm showing you transmission. So transmission is, does the light go through the lens? And of course, if the light is not going through the lens, the lens is useless because you know you can't see through it. So here is the transmission data for two lenses. One is the control lens, which is here, and the other is the vitamin E loaded lens. You can see in the visible spectrum, which starts at 400, both lenses release about 100% light. Now, the vitamin E loaded lenses actually block some UV light, which is actually a good thing because UV light is not good for the eye. So vitamin E has a beneficial effect of blocking UV light, but in terms of visible light, it doesn't block it, which obviously is a good thing. Also, we have to measure oxygen permeability and ion permeability through the contact lens because I, the contact lens needs to allow ions to diffuse and oxygen to diffuse because if that diffusion is impeded, that is bad for the corneal health. So here I'm showing you diffusion coefficient of ions as a function of vitamin E loading and Actually, it turns out if you put vitamin E into the eye, into the contact lens, sorry, the ion permeability goes down. So this is the ion permeability for three different lenses without any vitamin E. As you put a vitamin E, the ion permeability goes down, but still remains above what you need. So although permeability is going down, it is still high enough, so it is not an issue. 
We do the same measurement with oxygen permeability, and it turns out that again, the oxygen permeability remains high in presence of vitamin E, so again, it's not an issue. So what I've shown you is that with vitamin E, we can slow down drug transport, but also there is no other downside to including vitamin E, which means patients can actually wear it without affecting corneal health. So then the question is, I showed you one drug, bimetoprost, does it work for other drugs? And yes, the answer is it works for almost every drug we've explored. So here I'm showing you data for three other drugs, timolol, dexamethasone phosphate, and fluconazole. And I'm showing you data for four different lenses. And here on the x-axis, I'm showing you how much vitamin E is loaded into the lens. So 10%, 20%, 30%. On the y-axis, I'm showing you how much slowdown you get. Like for instance, in this graph, with 30% vitamin E, you get a 60-fold slowdown. So if the initial lens releases for three hours, the lens with vitamin E will release for 180 hours. And you can see it worked for actually, and the four different panels are four different types of contact lenses. So not only this approach works for different drugs, it also works for many different types of contact lenses, which again is actually very good. So uh, this again just shows you that if you look at the slowdown of how much slowdown you achieve with vitamin E loading, you get slowdown for these drugs, which these drugs are hydrophilic drugs, that means they're water soluble. You also get a slowdown for bimetoprost, which is actually oil soluble. So it works for both drugs but it works better for water soluble drugs. You can see here for 30%, this number is about 60. Here at 30%, this number is only about 30. So the approach works for both drugs, but it works better for water soluble drugs. Now here I'm showing you data for a post PRK lens. I think Dr. Tello had said that you are interested in a post PRK. So as you know that if you have PRK surgery or if you have post cataract or intravitreal injections after any surgery, the patients typically have to do a cocktail of drugs. They have to get a, do a drug to prevent infection, for example, moxifloxacin or leofloxacin. They have to put a typically a steroid like dexamethasone to prevent inflammation, and they also have to put a painkiller. So we, so we thought, okay, what if you put all these three drugs in the contact lens? And also sometimes what happens is after PRK surgery or after cataract surgery, patients are actually told to put bandage contact lens. So sometimes what happens is patients put a bandage contact lens and then they put drug on top of the bandage contact lens. So what happens is most of the drug doesn't go into the eye because the, the, the drug cannot cross the lens. So in this case, we thought it's, an, it's a natural marriage to put the drug inside the lens because patients are already using lens, patients are already using drug. Why not combine them? So that was, a, that was the idea behind designing this contact lens. So this contact lens it's again an AccuView Oasis contact lens that is approved as a bandage contact lens. And we put vitamin E barriers and we show that we can release all three drugs. This is uh, levofloxacin, this is ketorolac, and this is dexamethasone. We can combine these into the same lens and release that for about 100 hours, for about four days. So the idea here is that after the surgery, a patient will put the lens on and go home and keep the lens on for, out for four days, then the patient will come back to the doctor. The doctor will look at the eye, make sure everything is okay. If everything is okay, the doctor will take that lens off and put the second lens on for another four days. And after eight days, if you still need the lens, use another, if you still need the drug, use another lens. But after eight days, sometimes you don't need any more drug, in which case you're okay. So that's the idea behind this uh, combination therapy. And as I said, post PRK is certainly one potential application Post cataract is another very, very big application and also post intravitreal injections is another possibility. Here is another disease we are very interested in, in treating ulcers. The reason we are interested in treating ulcers is because as you all know, some ulcers, if you have a bad ulcer, patient could lose eyes. It's, it's, just, it's just a horrible thing to happen. And if a patient has ulcer, especially a grade three ulcer, you have to put so many eye drops. It's, it's, it's just, because you need the drug to get into the eye. And as I showed you, not much gets into the eye. With an eye drop, very little drug is getting in, only 1%. So you have no choice but to keep putting eye drops. You put eye drop, I, uh, uh, every, I think every uh, hospital and doctor is a slightly different protocol, depending upon the type of ulcer or the stage of ulcer. But in some cases, you have to put pretty much continuously eye drops. 
And also after the patient goes home, you have to tell them to put every hour, every half an hour, and the patients just don't do that. So instead of doing all of that, if you can put a contact lens on the ulcer where a lot more drug is going in, clearly that would be beneficial. So here again, uh, the idea is that we can put two different, uh, in this case, we are doing only moxifloxacin because in, in uh, the hospitals in US, uh, moxifloxacin is the most common drug for ulcers. So instead of putting eye drops, we can just put a moxifloxacin contact lens. And you can see again, the drug comes out for about three days with acuvioesis uh, or with true eye. And uh, after three days, or we can also increase this three days to five days by simply putting more vitamin E. But in any case, the idea is the same. The patient, you put the lens on, and after uh, three or four days, the patient comes back and you change the lens if you still need it. Uh, so that's, and here I'm showing you again for more drugs. So you can see that the beauty of this approach is it works for so many different drugs. I already showed you from data for timolol, fluconazole, dexamethasone phosphate, dexamethasone, cyclosporin, and we have data for about 20 different drugs uh, for which this approach works really, really well. So, so far I've shown you only in vitro data. And again, here's a summary that it works for many different drugs. So we also have done a lot of animal studies. So now I'm gonna start showing you some animal studies. And then uh, finally, I'll also show you uh, very early stage clinical data in humans. So, uh, so our main in one of our main interests right now is glaucoma. And for glaucoma, we were interested in, uh, uh, in a double, double drug therapy for many, because many patients have to take not just one eye drop, but two different types of eye drop. So in US, there is a therapy called uh, COSOP. So COSOP is a mixture of two different drugs, dorsolamide and timolol. And we wanted to see, can you combine those two drugs on the same contact lens and deliver it efficaciously? So in this case, we designed a contact lens, again, using vitamin E barrier technology, where without vitamin E, the drug comes out very, very quickly. With vitamin E, the drug comes out for about three days. So this is the lens. Then we put it on animals. So here I'm showing you data with eye drops. So the animals we chose are beagle dogs. The reason we chose beagle dogs is because uh, the, we had a colony of beagle dogs who already had glaucoma. Beagles are prone to glaucoma, so this colony had glaucoma. So we did not have to create the animal model. It was already there. And then we use eye drop therapy on one eye. So here we're looking at IOP as a function of time. There's one eye that is untreated, the green, and the yellow eyes are treated. So we put eye drops in one eye and leave the other eye as is. So you can see the one that was treated, the pressure went down. And uh, this therapy was two eye drops every day. It was BID, which is a standard therapy. And the pressure went down as expected because eye drops do work. But then uh, the eye drop, the pressure decrease was about 20%, uh, it was about 10%. You can see it was 2.6 milli milliliter of mercury, and that's about 10% of the baseline. So there was a 10% decrease in IOP, which is clinically significant. Then we used our contact lens. So we used our vitamin E loaded contact lens. And uh, here again, we had one treated eye, which is a yellow, and the untreated eye, which is green. And in this therapy, what we did was we took a contact lens loaded with the drugs and vitamin E, kept it on the eye for two days, for 48 hours. Then we removed the lens and put another eye for another 48 days. So for the first four days, there was therapy. But after that, there was no more therapy. Contact lenses were completely removed after four days. But when we looked at the data for IOP, it was amazing because we saw a decrease in IOP when the lens was on and that is expected. But the first thing is we, talk a, we saw a bigger decrease in IOP with the contact lens compared to eye drops. Now that was also expected because as I told you earlier on, we are getting more drugs to go into the eye. So that was what we were expecting. But the most amazing part of this study was that the IOP remained low even after we removed the lens. For about another nine days after we removed the lens, the pressure remained low. And this was very amazing. We were not expecting this. This is amazing because in terms of therapy, you can imagine there's nothing better than a patient having to do nothing. Because with glaucoma, compliance is a big problem. Patients don't put eye drops and that significantly increases their risk for eventually going blind. So nothing could be better than the patient just applying one lens, let's say a week, and then having to do nothing for the rest of the week. So this was very impressive. We wanted to understand what is causing this. So you can see, as I said, 
the pressure reduction is double that of eye drops, but more importantly, the pressure reduction persists after the lens is removed. So we wanted to understand the mechanism and understanding the mechanism is difficult in humans because you know you can't always acquire all the data you want. So we thought of using a, a pig eye uh, to start to understand our mechanism. So we took uh, we took a pig eye, and if you know uh, the, the if you look at a the the eye of a, of well of any animal, not just pig, you the cornea is a multi layer structure. There's an epithelium, then there is stroma, and there's endothelium and aqueous humor. And of course, there are membranes also that I'm not necessarily mentioning. So what happens is the drug, if you put the drug into tears, the drug has to first cross the epithelium, go to the stroma, and then go across endothelium. So our hypothesis was that when you put a contact lens on the, on the surface for four days, our hypothesis was that you start creating depot because the drug goes into epithelium, accumulates there at high concentration, when you remove the lens, the drug that is accumulated in cornea will then keep going to the aqueous humor and lead to efficacy. So that was our hypothesis. So the way we uh, explored the hypothesis was we took a pig eye, removed the cornea, mounted it in a diffusion cell, and then used confocal fluorescence microscopy to measure concentration of fluorescence across the cornea. Now, uh, most of the drugs don't have fluorescence, so we could not directly use a drug. Instead, we use fluorescein because fluorescein is a hydrophilic molecule. So we thought it would be a good mimic for the drug. So we did the study, and this is a study. There's a, two, there's a lot of data here. I'm not going to go into everything here. But what we measured was we measured fluorescence as a function of position along the cornea at different times. So, the, so this side is the aqueous humor or the endothelium. This side is the tears. And in this case, for simplicity, we made the drug start in the aqueous humor and go across towards the tear site. So what happens is if you look at initially, all the drug is in the aqueous humor, so the concentration everywhere is zero. And over time, the concentration starts to build up. Now, this is the, the fact that concentration builds up in stroma is obvious because stroma is hydrophilic, so the concentration will build up fairly quickly. But even though the concentration builds up, stroma cannot serve as a reservoir of drug because as the concentration builds up quickly, it will also empty out quickly. So although stroma contains a lot of the fluorescence, it cannot be the depot. But if you look at epithelium, you can see epithelium, the concentration increases very, very gradually. But after about six hours, there is a significant concentration. Now, after six hours, this cornea was not viable anymore. It started breaking apart, so we couldn't continue the experiment. But if you extrapolate, it shows that in about four days, which is how long uh, the animals had the lenses on, your cornea will actually get saturated with the drug. And then if you remove the lens, the cornea will keep releasing the drug and keep getting efficacy. So that was a very, very interesting result. All right, so that was, uh, we were very happy with animal studies. And we have done other animal studies also. Uh, so far, we have done it in, uh, in rabbits and also in, uh, in, in, in dogs. And we are planning to start a study in monkey very, very soon. Uh, now, because we already had data in animals and uh, rabbit, in animals, we were able to get permission from the FDA to do human studies, flog glaucoma. We submitted what is called an IND. And after that, we did a, a, we, we did a first study on safety of vitamin E loaded lenses. Because before we put the drugs, we just wanted to prove that patients can wear the lenses with just vitamin E. This was, a, again, a pilot study with only 10 patients. Uh, patients put the lens on for a day and then came back and put a different lens for another day. And it was only a two-day study. But in this two-day study, the patients had no toxicity. All the 10 patients were able to comfortably tolerate the lens. They were able to see through the lens. So there, is, and, uh, there was no issue of uh, blocking vision. And also there was no toxicity. So this was, uh, this was encouraging. After that, we did a, a pilot clinical study on safe and efficacy. Now this is very early stage. We have done only two patients. Uh, but in these two patients, what we did was, it was the same protocol. The patient came to the, to the clinic. Uh, we put a lens on them with the drug and vitamin E. We kept the lens on for one day. And then the patient came back. We put a different lens for another day, and after two days, there was no lens. So the therapy was only for two days, 
and we are measuring the pressure in the inside the eye in the eye for about uh, about 10 days so you can see here again as you put the lens the pressure went down from about 20 to about 12 which is actually a very significant decrease much better, much more than what you get with eye drops but more importantly the pressure remained low for about 10 days even though the lenses were removed after only two days. So this was very encouraging, both the subject one and subject two. So still very early stage because of course we have done only two patients and you know with two patients, you can't really make a, you know, significant conclusions. But by combining this with also what we observed in animals, this is very encouraging that number one, the lenses are safe and number two, the lenses are also efficacious. So this work was all in glaucoma. Now, uh, we are also interested in many other diseases. I showed you uh, that we are interested in infections. We are interested in post PRK. There's another disease we are interested in, and this is a disease that are unfamiliar to many people, including ophthalmologists, because it is an orphan disease. So I always like talking about it if, if, because uh, you know I want more and more people to know about this disease. It's called cystinosis. Uh, it's a disease with very few patients, and only about 2,000 patients worldwide. So I don't know how many patients you have in Colombia. But many ophthalmologists have never encountered this disease. But the reason we are, I'm very interested in this is because uh, uh, I, I work with a foundation, uh, a foundation for cystinosis that is very interested in developing this contact lens for their patients because it's a bad disease. It's a disease in which uh, you, uh, you get, it's a systemic disease. You affect your eyes, you also affect your kidneys, you really affect every tissue. But in eye, if you don't treat it, you go blind. And what happens in this case is you get crystals of cysteine. cysteine. Cysteine is an amino acid, and cysteine is a dimer of that. So you get crystals of cysteine in your eye, and if you don't treat it, you go blind. And the way you treat it currently is you put eye drop, but you, put, you have to put eye drop every hour, every day for your entire life. And that obviously is very, very tedious. Patients don't do that. And that is obviously very bad for the patient. So we are developing, because with a contact lens, we can get so much drug into the eye, we think we can do better than eye drops. So uh, the problem with eye drop therapy, as I said, is you have to put too many eye drops. So here again, what we did was we designed a contact lens for delivering. And uh, you can see that here is the data for this drug. The drug used to treat cystinosis is called cystiamine. So we released cystiamine from a commercial contact lens and the drug comes out in about five minutes because it's a very small molecule. It comes out very quickly. With our vitamin E technology, we can design a contact lens that releases it for about four hours, which is what we need because in this case, we want patients to change the lens every day. So the idea is in this case, patients will wear a lens for four days, take it off or wear it for the entire day, take it off at night. The next day, they'll wear a different lens. And then we did a safety study in rabbits. So we put the lens in rabbits and there was no toxicity. And I think this is the paper that Dr. Tello uh, came across. Uh, this was, no, no, sorry, but Dr. Tello came across pyrifinidone, not cystiamine. Uh, but anyway, yeah, with cystiamine, we did, uh, we did a safety study and the, 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 the rabbit tolerated the lens, tolerated the drug. There was no, there was no incidence of any uh, toxicity. So that was good. And then you want to look for efficacy. The problem with efficacy for this drug is that there is no good animal model. The only good animal model for cystinosis is a knockout mice. Uh, and putting contact lenses in mice is challenging. So what we did was we developed what is called an ex vivo model. We took an eye, uh, we took a cadaver uh, rabbit eye, and we created crystals of the drug by loading it with, the, with of cystine by loading with cystine. So what we did was we put cystine into the eye and showed that it crystallizes. And we showed that the lens, that, that the ex vivo eye looks very much like in vivo. So this picture is ex vivo, this is in vivo, and you can see they basically look the same. So that was good. And here again, we looked at it with a microscope and we saw that the crystals that you form in the eye, ex vivo are very much similar to in vivo. And so we were pretty happy. And here you can see we created the crystals. And after putting contact lenses on, we completely cleared out the crystals. So you can see very quickly, we can clear out all the crystals from the eye. So it's very efficacious. And then we uh, did some comparison with eye drops and we saw that with every contact lens, we can get as much efficacy as about 10 drops. So as I told you early on, it is much more efficacious than eye drops. And typically, and so basically what it means is the patient can wear one lens a day and that should be sufficient for the patient. So we are very excited about pursuing this 
And we are talking to the foundation in Ireland to see if we could start doing some clinical studies with this lens. Uh, well, this is again. So, so far, the, all, the, all the data and all the work I've shown you is for the front of the eye. And we are definitely very interested in the front of the eye, but we are also interested in delivering drug to the back of the eye by using contact lenses. Now, as you all know, to deliver drug to the back of the eye, you have to use injections. And injections, of course, are very painful and they could also damage the retina in some cases. So we are exploring, can you deliver drug to the back of the eye by using a contact lens? So imagine you put a contact lens on and we are, we, now obviously some drug will go into the anterior chamber. Now this, the drug that goes to the anterior chamber really cannot go to the back because what, is, what happens is there's a flow of tears from the vitreous to the aqueous, so the liquid. Tears basically flow like this in the opposite direction. So the drug that goes into anterior chamber, in our opinion, cannot go to the back. So this path is not viable. But a path that is viable is for the drug to diffuse into the cornea and then diffuse laterally into the sclera, uh, conjunctiva sclera, and then basically diffuse in this pathway into the retina and vitreous. So we're exploring that pathway and we have some encouraging results. But another possibility is to design a contact lens with electrodes. So imagine that you have a contact lens and uh, let's look at this scenario. Imagine a contact lens where you have an electrode. So you have a positive electrode or a negative electrode. And then if you put this lens with electrodes, what might happen is the drug might basically, so in this scenario, so in this scenario, imagine that you put a contact lens on with electrodes. And then if you put the drug, and let's say the drug is charged, then the electrode will directly push the drug into the back of the eye. And therefore you can get direct drug delivery to the back of the eye by using contact lenses with electrodes. So we've been looking at that approach and I think uh, I wanna leave enough time for questions. So I don't, I'm not gonna go into this in too much details, but we have developed a contact lens that has electrodes. Now this work is very early stage. We haven't even done animal studies. We have only done XVOI. XVOI is we take the eye out, we put a contact lens with electrodes and we show uh, the stuff can go in. So here we did a, instead of starting with drugs, we always start with fluorescent molecules because they're easy to see. So here we show that without electric field, nothing goes into the back of the eye. But if you start putting electric field, you can get a lot of uh, hydrophobic dye, in this case, Nile blue into the back of the eye. So you can see there's Nile blue in the retina. There's also some Nile blue in the choroid. Now there's no Nile blue in the vitreous because Nile blue is very, very hydrophobic. So it doesn't go into the vitreous, but that's a good thing because the drug you can see is highly localized in the retina, which is where it might be needed for some indications. Uh, now, if you want the drug to go into the vitreous, you have to choose a hydrophilic dye drug. So we did a hydrophilic dye called fluorescein. In that case, you can see a lot of the dye actually went into the vitreous and we can measure considerable concentration. We also compared this, uh, we, so we measured the concentration and then we try to compare it with the commercial devices that are already in the market. So these are some of the commercial devices and we compared how much drug can go with devices like Retisert, Illuvian, Orthodex. And we, we concluded that the amount of drug that is going in with our device is actually comparable to the amount that goes in with this device. So we are very excited by this possibility of delivering drug directly to the back of the eye, also by using contact lenses, either with electrodes or without electrodes. and we have actively pursuing that now. Uh, okay, so the, this is just how we made the contact lenses. So we actually make the electrodes and also we assemble a battery inside the contact lens because you also need the battery. And this is a picture of, uh, of this is the battery. So this is one surface and the other surface is connected by a gold wire. So basically this is a contact lens with electrodes and a battery inside. And you can see it is actually sitting on the cornea. Now this is still very early stage. And as I said, uh, I, we have not even done animal studies. We only done uh, uh, in ex vivo studies. So, uh, so now I'm gonna summarize as I said, I wanted to leave sufficient time for questions. So in the summary, uh, I hope I have convinced you that contact lenses are very effective for getting drug into the eye, much more effective than eye drops. I hopefully I have convinced you that the technology we have developed, vitamin E technology is very good at increasing release duration of all types of drugs. And also uh, by using contact lens, we might be able to create a depot in the eye and that depot could lead to efficacy beyond even, really, beyond even the weird duration of a contact lens. 
And uh, hopefully I've, I, I've convinced you with some very preliminary and uh, with animal data and preliminary human data that this approach is very effective and, and safe also. So uh, finally, I'd like to thank the students that some, did some of the work and the funding agencies. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, especially Dr. Tello for reaching out to me uh, and to the rest of you obviously also for taking part in this presentation and I will be happy to answer questions. Dr. Chawan, thank you for your great lecture on this very, very exciting topic. Very interesting. Thank you, thank you very much. Would you like me to stop the share? Or would you like me to keep the share on so we can go back to slides if needed? Yes, I think it, it, it's a good idea to keep the, the share okay. to go to the slides. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. In, the, in the pilot study with the uh, uh, glaucoma patients, the two patients, uh, you, you had a very, very important uh, dimini, uh, reduction of the intraocular pressure. What, what exactly what medication did you use? Right, so it was the, uh, it was a dual, the, it was the same therapy that was in animals. So it was timolol and dorzolomide combined together. Interesting. So was, uh, yeah, yeah, so it is called COSOPT. So it's COSOPT and uh, yeah, it's a combination of those two drugs. Yes, very, very interesting. And, and the idea is that uh, the, the, uh, the, len the contact lenses are the one, the one day option commercial lenses? Uh, yes, except people. Yo le dije más le dije que 1700 metros hizo en 170 mil, pero no importa. Esto, sí, de, de, ¿por qué no le dicen? A ver si nosotros podemos participar en algún estudio, en algo, dile tú ahí. Sí, 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 pero bueno, sí. es que ya se acabó, ya se acabó. Sí, estamos hablando con el doctor Galvis. Eh, ok, so. Pedro. Sí, doctor Galvis. We would like to know if we could make a, a study with him. In, uh, yeah. It's possible. Oh yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. I see. That's, that's what I'm hoping. To, yeah, that's what I'm hoping to get out of this, is to establish a collaboration where we can do uh, animal studies, clinical studies, whatever studies you're interested in. Uh, yes. I have, I have collaborators all around the world. I would love to have collaborators. Uh, yeah, I'd love to collaborate with you. We, we, but of we course, are... as you know, to I think this, to do that, I would need to learn a little bit more about how the process works because, as you know. In US, we have to work with the FDA uh, before we start a clinical study of submitting uh, IND. So uh, I could work with you, learn about the process, and then yeah, we could work through the leg regulatory agencies or whatever is needed and do a clinical study. Which Perfect. Is Dr. Chawan, Dr. Chawan, a question. Yeah. Currently, you are preparing the vitamin E lenses in your laboratory, right? Actually, yeah, well, yes and no. For clinical studies, for, for Humans, for human studies, we cannot do that. For human studies, we are not allowed to put lenses. So we have to work with pharmacies. So we work with pharmacies uh, where they make the lenses that can be put on patients. It's the same lens, uh, but we have to transfer the technology because that's a requirement of the FDA, that it has to be made in approved pharmacies. So if we do a study with yeah. you, Okay, yeah, uh, but uh, you, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a complex uh, uh, procedure. procedure. Uh, no, it is not a very complex procedure. We can even show you how to do it. Uh, but, but the idea at the end would be that you can uh, market the lenses with the medication in a special or, or, or what is the final exactly. idea of these yep. lenses? It will, be, uh, it will be a contact lens that is packaged, which contains vitamins. So you open the package and you put the lens on. And after a day or two days or whatever the design is, you take the lens out and throw it away. You cannot reload it with drug. Now, from, exactly. the, from, the, from the technology perspective, you can reload the drug. There's not a problem. But from the perspective of regulatory agencies, they don't want to do that. Because, okay, okay. So the idea is that the lenses will be ready to use with vitamin A, E and the medication. Exactly. You open the vial and, and I, I, I yeah. wish I had a vial. I don't have and, it with and, me right now, but yeah, you, and, it's, it's a that, vial like, you know, like, like a vial with injection, you, you open of it. Of course, that's a very interesting uh, approach 
for the future, a very appealing one. Alejandro, the, the, the lens comes with vitamin A, and we, we need to put here the drug that we need? Currently, they, uh, okay, currently, yes, the pharmacy needs to prepare the lenses. All right, so we could do it both ways. We could send you lenses with vitamin E already loaded, and you could put the drug, or we can send you lenses with vitamin E and drug. It's really Perfect. your preference. Perfect. Uh, excellent, excellent. The, the, way, the way for the research is across uh, Dr. Telio. Uh, he is the director of our clinic in research, and uh, he's going to stay in contact with you. Okay. And uh, we need your support, and uh, all the connection is going to be full with him. Okay. Alex, you Dr. have... Dr. Chauhan, thank you again for, for, for this very interesting uh, lecture. I think this, we are looking at the future of the medication in uh, releasing ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I definitely think so. I think uh, because uh, eye drops are just not very good. And I think people have been, people, people have known that for a long time that eye drops are not, not very good. But the problem is that it is the best out there, but contact lenses are significantly superior. The only challenge with contact lenses is, that, which we to get told all the time, that, they, the, that for glaucoma, they say the elderly cannot put contact lenses off. That's the only negative thing we have heard. But for, but still, you know, and even in glaucoma, there are many young patients who have glaucoma. So for them, it is perfect. But also for some of these other diseases like post-PRK, infection, uh, cystinosis, uh, dry eyes, for all of those, yeah, contact lenses, I think, are just the, the most- Alex. Uh, and we, can, we, we could use this kind of lenses with the prescription in myopic uh, child and with, the, with atropine. And uh, yeah. we, we don't need to use uh, every week the, the doses. Just use the, the, the lens, change the lens. And exactly. it could be for us because our, our subject is, is myopia. And it's a good idea if we can start to work with atropine in that kind of lenses. Have you, have you tried with atropine in no, the... or I, no, I, I can tell you no, because I just don't think there is enough data out there for myopia control. I mean, I, you're right. Myopia control is the biggest problem right now in the entire world. I go to conferences where the entire session is focused on myopia control. In fact, I can tell you my own son has myopia, childhood myopia. But yeah. rather than going with atropine, in his case, we are going with the, with the, you know, the ortho K lenses. So we are using ortho K lenses on him. Yes, yes. Okay, but but right. it because could of the be... reason I can tell you, the reason is with. So yes, you can deliver a lot of drug to the eye, but there are no clinical studies to show what is the effect of that on myopia. So the. Yeah. Uh, right. but, but now the evidence is growing, uh, and and we could we could discuss uh, that topic later. But Dr. Shohan, uh, we will meet again with you, of course, to 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 uh, make uh, to to make the studies here in, in Colombia with with the lenses. Uh, so I will I will email you and 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 we will uh, meet to discuss exactly the details. I will be with another epidemiologist uh, from the research office okay. and, and, and we uh, will take uh, the option that you are offering us that we are very interested in. Okay, uh, so we can discuss later what other drugs you're interested in. Do we send you drug, lens with drugs or without drugs? And also the regulatory path because that obviously is very important to understand yes. uh, uh, that do we need a uh, like in some, some countries, you can do these studies without uh, the FDA approval or without the equivalent by something called an IRB. So IRB is Institutional Review Board. Uh, so I don't know in Colombia, do you need, F, do you need the IND yeah. or just IRB? We need, we need, we need, yes, we also need. So it will be a, a, a path that we, we need to, to walk, to make step by step, but we, we will do it. All right. Wonderful. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you again. Dr. Chahan, how are you? My name is uh, Ruben Borospi. Thank you for your lecture. It was very excellent.
Thank you. Thank I you just Ruben. wanted, uh, before we are over, I just wanted uh, to answer the question you asked at the beginning uh, about telling you a little bit more about us. And uh, Dr. Galvis started to talk a little bit, uh, but then we started the lecture and he didn't finish. I just wanted to, to tell you that we are a very big institution uh, in Colombia. Uh, we are situated in a city called Bucaramanga, which is not very big. It has almost 2 million people in the metropolitan area. However, our institution, our hospital is a fourth level institution. We do all kinds of procedures. We have all the specialties known to medicine, uh, all kinds of transplants and everything. Uh, the area, I think Dr. Galvis uh, on the trying to convert made a little bit, a little mistake but the area that we have is around 160,000 square meters of the clinic. I have trouble with the conversion to square feet so that you understand us a little bit. However, it's a very big area. Yes, yes. Our institution, which uh, the founder is Dr. Galvis, it's a, a private practice within inside the clinic. However, this uh, practice, uh, it's made out of 15 ophthalmologists of all specialties with all different skills and very well preparated uh, in, in our fields. Um, we have all the equipments up to date. Uh, Dr. Galvis has always um, uh, gave us whatever the newest uh, things, gadgets and things for us to play, the new toys like we call them. Uh, as soon as they come out, we have them. So we, have, we are a very, very big institution and we do have a lot of patients. We have a lot of referrals from other cities and uh, uh, even other countries around the area of South America. Uh, so I think it's a very good opportunity for us to work together, as Dr. Tello said. Also, we have a very, it's a getting stronger every time a, a research department, which Dr. Tello and Dr. Galvis uh, belong in the, in the directive board of it. So we have, um, a lot of things to, to, to work with, and it will be amazing to, to work with you in your, in your research. Yeah, That's definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ruben, for those details. It's, it's definitely a very exciting opportunity, and I look forward to uh, yeah, continuing our collaboration. It's important to send him the, our brochure, uh, Dr. Telio, because uh, I. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, yes. We will send it to him. Thanks a lot, Dr. John, for your okay. lecture. It's thank very, you, very you. interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Uh, and and uh, I will be uh, sending you an email tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Look Thanks forward. a lot. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everybody, then. Goodbye. Thank you.